Okay. So welcome, this is the district advisory board meeting of August 11. So we call to order. Um, I cannot see. So the first item on the agenda was to approve the minutes, but I don't think we have them yet. Let me just share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. 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 But Excellent. I don't I didn't see them in the packet yesterday. I didn't see them in the packet either. Oh. So you two came in late. I had explained um that I had asked Brianna Sunrud from our IT department to uh remember I was talking about streamlining the website. Um <laughs> the way we had originally set it up, we had um on the page for the DAB, we had everything going into one place for packets and it wasn't differentiated by meeting date. Mm -hmm. Right. But she has since changed it around. And when she did that, it happened this morning. I had to rearrange everything. So I had to move things from one place to another. So you probably, everything's back where it lives right now. Um, so that's probably why you probably poked, looked at it and it wasn't there when you were looking. Yes. So, so I would move to postpone the discussion unless uh, until next meeting, because uh, I didn't have time to read it as I would not be able to, I would have to abstain and I don't know who else would be in the situa same situation. I agree. Okay. Somebody seconds it or? Second. Uh, Second. Okay. So uh, do I have to make a roll call? No. No, okay. So we move to postpone the discussion until the next meeting of the um so make a note about the minutes from previous meeting yeah i mean okay. i i did have one other comment on that i noticed that some agendas some um committees they put the review of the minutes at the end of the meeting i don't know uh, if, we, if we feel like we might get bogged down in it or something it's it's up to the chairs to decide how, what they prefer but. okay Anyway, I accept preferences. Uh, I've been in committees at the, at the beginning. If, if people have preference to put it at the end, I'm okay to put it at the end of the meetings. I, I prefer the beginning if we can do it quickly. I okay. think it helps it helps people remember what we did at the last meeting. Yeah, but, it's, um, a, I guess it's a way of recapping and making sure that we approve them and we don't lag like, behind on the approving. I, okay. I agree with that. I just want to, um, I, I guess a point of order is, do we need to do a roll call vote? Because the other committees that I'm on, we do a roll call vote for all decisions. Oh. Okay. So we can I, do a... I just don't know. I'm, I, that's a, it's a question. I guess I was just thinking in the case of a minute, it's not really a decision, right? Like that we just, we'll review the minutes at the next time and accept the minutes or edit the minutes at the next meeting. That's what I defer to the Chairs on that. We can do a roll call vote about the decision about the firm for next meeting. So, um, okay. Tammy Parks? Aye. Joseph Gordon? Aye. Peggy Shannon? Aye. Tracy Safian? Aye. Marilyn Blossing? Aye. Irene Hovne? Aye. So, in motion passes to move the discussion for next meeting. Can can I throw out one other note? Yes. Can I just have my name changed to Tammy on the mini on the meetings? It's just my preferred name. Tammy, you are coming up as Tammy. Where where are you? You mean in the uh, meeting in the minutes? Yeah. If you look at the minutes. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. That's for Joseph. Okay. Um, I cannot see if we have um. Oh, um people for making public comments? There are no people in the attendees section at all. So this is what I ask, if any other people want to make a public comment? I don't know if your Susan or Mike would be. Be the public? Yes. No, I mean, they're on the committee. No, they're, yeah, they're members on the of the committee too, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Um, the next, we're going fast. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a standing item that we decided to put um, clarifying this for Merlin uh, Blasting that you are not here. 
whether we want to change any rules or regulations of the procedure um, based on um, how we are conducting the meetings. And this is, we agreed last time that we to have it as a standing order to see if we needed to make adjustments to each meeting. So how do everybody feel? How do we have to make any change? I think it would be helpful to let Marilyn know that what we decided yeah. last meeting is that we would limit um, um, public comments to three minutes per share um, and that we would have public comments at the beginning and at the end, although we didn't put it at today's ending of agenda um, and see how that goes, that we really want to encourage the public to comment and we don't want to end up getting bogged down during the meetings. So. That sounds reasonable to me, um, I guess. And I think the discussion, I did watch the video, but I, I think part of the discussion was whether you limit it to one, per only a person can only speak once. And I think that's something we need to review. If there, you know, if, if today is any example, I don't think we have to worry about it, but I am a little concerned if there's many people, we don't want anyone to monopolize. So, my opinion. Tommy? I wanted to throw out that we might also want to limit the comment period at the beginning of the meeting so we don't end up having extra hugely long meetings or not getting to, you know, the matter uh, because we're listening to comments. So I guess if we just limit it at the beginning, at the end, you know, I guess we can be a little more open about it, but I'm just thinking it's important to get to the, this, to the meeting. That seems reasonable. Okay, so does anybody, do we want to do it at this moment or in case we needed to have it as a, or you want to set it in stone now? I, I think we move on for now. I don't think we yeah. need to set it right now. Yeah. There's nobody commenting. Uh, that's my point. Um, great. Um, the next item was open meeting law refresher. And the material was posted in the package. And this came about because at some point we started exchanging. I think I, I requested some material for Susan uh, via email. And her concern was not to have communications and that everybody is clear on the open meeting law. So it would be a good refresher that there should not be exchange of opinions where, with people that you might reach for. I think that's one of the biggest items. We should not be discussing things offline um, if we reach core of, of items about um, this um, board. Right, anything that's under the jurisdiction of this group should not be discussed outside of a posted meeting. And that includes also, um, I forget what you call it, but if one person talks to one person, then that second person talks to a third person, that third person talks to a fourth person, that's violating open meeting law as well. Um, yeah, okay. I did send, um, you, did you see the FAQs? Those are very helpful. It talks about the electronic um, regulations. This yeah, and list serve uh, belonging to list serves that might talk about yep. this on um, social media. Yes, yeah, all kinds of things you can refer to. So, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So, I think everybody's clear on it. Okay. Then, next, uh, anybody has any questions or shall we discuss? But okay. The next item is um, the consultation with about the precinct numbers and the clarification of section 10.4, I believe it was, uh, regarding the precinct names and numbers on the charter. So that, that was me. Um, it's actually section 10.7. Oh, 10.7, okay. 10.7E. And I did not contact um, the town attorney because they were working on, we're still in the midst of a lawsuit and they had all hands on deck and they had a filing deadline of Monday. So um, they were working all weekend, all day Friday. Uh, Amber was here in the office until seven o'clock Friday night. So it just, I didn't bother. But what I did do is I went back and read it and it dawned on me that um, I did send our town manager a quick email but he hasn't responded yet. But um, 
This section 10.7 falls under Article 10 transition position uh, provisions. And so it relates to the, our transition stage of the town government from, you know, how to how to basically ease into this new charter from the old from the old form of government. And it states basically, you know, it, it outlines what you shall do for the very first election. Um, but then it says the first regular election under this charter is provided under Article 7. So then when you look at Article 7, um, that strictly talks about Section 7.4 under Article 7. It talks about just districts and it just says the territory of AMRA shall be divided into five districts based on you know all the same things that we're, we're gonna be working on. Um, and that the role of the districting advisory board is to review such district and propose changes if necessary to such districts to ensure their uniformity in number of inhabitants and conformity with state and federal law. So um, I think at that point it was clear to me that the question, I think what the que again, the question was, do we keep things as district one through five with the precincts one and three under this district? I think that's what the question was. And obviously it's gonna be no. And I think at that point, um, when we determine what precincts are going under what districts and we propose that to the town council, they're going to have to take it from there and whether they have to file for new legislation to, re to change our charter, I don't know. Um, so I would like, I still I would feel better if, whether, when, if we have clarification from legal counsel, uh, particularly after reading the minutes from the Charter Commission when they were talking exactly about this. Um, they were mentioning that if they were needing more precincts, at least in, it was on the minutes of, of um, the Charter Commission, and they were talking about exactly when they talked about the number of precincts, they said, oh, we may need and revise the charter. Uh, I know that that's maybe no, it, was a, it was a comment. I'm not a lawyer again. I would, I would feel better and make sure that we dot all the I's. And we, since this is the first time we are doing this, that we make sure that we but, will have problems. We are early in the process, so. Yeah, but what is your question exactly? That's what that, I'm, I'm uh, my about. Question, my question is exactly, because it also talks about the, it talks about the first regular election. This would mm -hmm. be the first regular election or not under the charter or the second. Say that one more time. It talks is this about- the, this, Yes, uh, Marilyn Blaustein and first and Tracy. So my understanding is that they're talking about the 2021 election. Mm -hmm. And from what I heard, these precincts will not, the decisions we recommend as a committee will not be applied until 2022, correct? Correct. correct. So it has nothing okay. to do with the 2021 election. Okay. I don't think that was the question though. Was that the question? No, but it might clarify my doubts because I think okay. this is the first time we are running elections. The second time. Right, okay. right, right. This won't affect the elections yeah. next year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tracy, you had a comment? Yeah, I actually had a comment just about um, public participation for this meeting. Um, and I'm sorry, this is off topic of what we're talking about, but I noticed that the, um, the listing on the amherstma.gov calendar for this meeting where it says link click here to join the virtual meeting that the link is like not complete and it doesn't work like if the public was attempting to join this meeting it has the um so it's got it typed out though right web id no, number and all that it does not it doesn't have it in the link it has it in the location of the meeting but like if somebody oh. just clicked on the link I mean, right, you're correct that you can add the web ID to the meeting, but yep, yep. just perhaps to like check that for the next meeting. And, yeah, and the I fact that we don't have any members of the public, I don't know, but. And actually one just popped in, but I don't normally supply a link. We usually just give the web ID and a phone number, but I mean, it certainly can it be It does added. say, I mean, typically, right, if it, I mean, right on this announcement, it says link click to join the virtual meeting. So I would think that the link 
click to join the virtual meeting should be a link with the meeting ID. Okay, I'll personally, check it out. but check it out. Yep, yep. I mean, just for people, particularly somebody who's not like super computer savvy and don't okay. want to make it harder or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I'll check it out. Okay, and that was uh, we had somebody in the attendee. It was Dee Shiba, so I just let her in the room. Hi, Dee. Hi, Dee. Hi, Dee. So um, I wanted to check. So the, the the feeling in the committee is that we don't need to consult legal and that we are okay. My feeling is that we're okay, but um, once the dust settles for the lawsuit, it, it doesn't seem like it would be terrible to check with the town attorney just to confirm. Or, I mean, I guess, you know, I guess I would check first with the like town manager, also like the council or the council president on like their interpretation of the charter. I've done that. Too. So when I hear back, I'll let you know. So I mean, just okay. in terms of like mm -hmm. attorney resources and all that, but. Yeah. Um, so Susan, can as soon as you hear, can you put the summary of the email on the package for next week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we have it. I have to give a little nudge, but yes, okay. I'm gonna put it on the agenda item. <laughs> I'm making a list. <laughs> well, actually, I think is it next week. Um, I will have to give a nudge. Next next week, the town manager's on vacation. So if you can give him a nudge before he goes on vacation, yes. and probably this is not on the priority list, but if you can mm -hmm. give Try a to nudge, push it along. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, the next item is about the e update on the email and website. Uh, I think Susan, you were mentioning that the website now looks somewhat different. I didn't have time to check it yet. Yes. Um, so we set it up where instead of all of our packet materials going into one huge depository, um, it's now going to list packet materials for each date. So each meeting date. So you know, on eight four we talked about this, and eight eleven we talked about this. So that's been organized. Um, the meeting postings will go on there in their own section. The agenda also goes on there in its own section. And there's also going to be a place for all recorded meetings, so people can just click on, you know, go to the DAB webpage and see all of that. So that's organized. And then for email. Um, Mike and I sent Paul an email and what we got back, I'll read it to you. Um, we asked him if it was possible to set up a new email address for the DAB to receive public comments. And he replied, we do not create group email addresses except under very rare circumstances. The reasons is the ongoing maintenance, lack of clear ownership of response and the danger of violating the open meeting law. Our standard operating procedure is to have emails managed by the staff liaison. So with that said, I'm happy to manage emails. It would go to the town clerk department. I think um, maybe we could somehow get word out that in the in the um, subject line, they can whoever's submitting a comment can put districting advisory boards so that we can pick them out quickly and easily. But we're not bombarded by emails right now. It's not too bad. And when we do get requests for um, mail-in or absentee ballots, we have our own dedicated email address for that. So yeah, I'm fine with that in light of this. It's already listed on the website, staff liaison with my email address on there, so. Okay. But do people know about these rules outside the small network of people? Um, is there a place that we can tell people that this is the email of the committee? Because it, what it's clear, it's it's clear when you have a, a an email that is the DAB, it's not so clear when it's you. Um, I see Hans, Tracy, and then Joseph. Um, yeah, so I don't know, Sue, is it possible to add just to the website as you're suggesting um, where it says contact you? Can you just ha have something there about like subject line or yeah, something? Yeah, I was just gonna say that. 
That's exactly and, what and, I was And I have a um, related question just about this page is that I believe this is a, a committee of the town council. And as such, I didn't know whether it should be listed under the town council committees and not it's, under the main committee. It's not or should it be under both? It is it, created by the town council. The town council has jurisdiction over it and they're the ones who like choose the members. It's not selected by the town manager. Correct. They're the appointing authority, but it's not like the um, OCA and GOL. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you go on, well, if you search for boards and committees and just search by name, it'll come up with our page, but I'll definitely on the page. Make or maybe it, even with count, I mean, maybe under the council committees, right, that it could. I know what you're saying, but I don't know how, like, for example, the finance committee, like is a council committee, it's considered, so it's listed under council committees or ad hoc committees. So I don't know. I mean, maybe it could be listed both places or something in case somebody's looking. Anyway, it's just a thought. Yeah, I'm just thinking when somebody goes to look, yeah, I'll just think, think into that. Cause I know when you're looking for boards and committees, you go under boards and committees and if you search all, they're all, they're all there like right. you know, medical order. So I'll, I'll take a look at that. And see like the it. finance committee, I think the finance committee is listed under both. Okay. Check out. Okay. Yes, uh, the finance committee is listed under both. Anyway, okay. 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 Joseph, do you have a comment? Uh, yes. So in regards to letting the public know there's some sort of email where they can send comment in the future when we're going to be sending out or making public, whatever maps we're working on. This might be a question for Mike with formatting, but is there any way on those drafts that we send out, like in the bottom, it's like for comment, email, staff liaison to sort of like make it so there isn't like one specific place you can find this information. It can be like a very um, uh, abundant resource. Yeah. So. I had my hand up next. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take that comment and then I'll spin into what I was gonna say. Absolutely, absolutely, Joe. We can, on the maps that we'll be producing, the draft maps that we'll be producing, we can put, you know, how to contact us. We can put email on there. We can write addresses for if people want to write a letter and mail it to somebody. We can, we can customize that to do whatever we want. Um, and my suggestion would be when I'm looking at the districting advisory board website would be, we should have a little section that says how to make a public comment. And then right beneath that have three options or at least three, but the three that I can think of off the top of my head, one, join the meeting and, you know, comment during the public comment period Two, send an email to this email address, which would be Sue's email address as the staff liaison. And three would be, if you want to send us a, um, if you want to mail us something, mail it to this address. Um, so, you know, just so that it's, it's straightforward and it's, it, when people go to the DAB website, it's right there in front of them. I think that would be helpful. And I'm sure there's more than just three methods, but that's what I can think of off the top of my head. Um, the open meeting law allows the public to um, address uh, address us individually, right? I mean, so if somebody wanted to make a comment by approaching one of us, that's also okay? Yes? I think, uh, no, I'm just thinking about it. They can approach you and then it's something that you could, we could put on the agenda to discuss at the next meeting, comments made by public to count to, you know, whoever. I mean, it seems pretty common, right? That you know, members of the public will come to committee members yeah. and bring things up. Right, um, as long as you're not a quorum and discussing things, you know. I mean, and I guess too, yeah. like if somebody emailed you personally, you could also forward the email like to the group or something. Um, and I guess just as to what uh, Joseph had brought up earlier, like if we do have materials that we're sending out just to make it clear that if you not just not just that our email address is like town clerk, but if you're emailing town clerk at amherst.ma.gov, it's actually the committee. Like, you know, email 
and I and that's where you could just say the subject line thing, just so people don't feel like it's just going to the clerk's office and like where is the DAB ever going to see this or something, you know, to contact the DAB, email the clerk subject line, you know, DAB or whatever, or something, mm -hmm. but to make sure. <laughs> So I have a question, uh, Susan, how would you manage those emails? Would you put them to the to the package as a separate comments, public comments? Do we have an item public comments as the emails? And uh, is there going to be something that you send back to the people? We receive your email and it would be forwarded to the committee or? So that people yeah. know that it was received and it's going to be forwarded, but it doesn't go into a heap. Yeah, I'll lost in space. Yeah, no, I always respond to email. So I would definitely acknowledge their email and say that I passed their comments along. I'll come up with some kind of wording, general wording. Um, I've got a folder right now for the redistricting. Everything's in there. And I think what I'll do is put a subfolder just for the emails and the pub public comment. And then... Um, what I do is save those emails as a PDF, and then I can put it in the packet. Okay. That's what other, I've checked around with a couple other staff liaisons and that's what they're doing currently. Yeah. Okay. If that works, does that work? I like the idea of a packet just so we don't get emails like all the time. I mean, especially if we're meeting regularly. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I prefer everything, as I said before, I agree. I prefer that everything is public and in one place and it's, everybody can access it the same way we have, so. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, okay, thank you, Mike, for checking with uh, about the email. Um, the next item on the agenda, um, I was asked to put it by Tracy about committee vacancies. I think we are not at full capacity. Um, so I don't know how we can encourage people from the districts that are missing um, to put names forward. Yes, Tracy. Um, yeah, so I'll just mention on this. So um, the the members of this committee, the resident members, like were selected through a process, like applied to the GOL, right? And then yeah. the GOL recommended people and then forwarded that to the council and the council voted on it. And so I did reach out to the chair of the GOL, um, George Ryan, because he's one of my counselors and I'm in touch with him regularly anyway. Um, and what he told me is that, um, you know that he wasn't always he wasn't sure about getting members on the committee you know now that the committee is underway but that they would try i mean i know that with the summer that the gol isn't meeting that often and that the council isn't meeting that often either i know the council's next meeting is august 23rd so um ideally i think if we if there was somebody who's interested like to let them know to contact the GOL like right away. I mean, to fill out the form or contact the GOL right away and to express interest. And then they, of course they'd have to submit like a statement of interest or something. But it does seem like it would be, I, I mean, the last DAB, the one from 2011, it, they had a full committee of nine members. And I just, I do worry a little bit just, you know, both in the summer and then as the school year gets underway and things, people are busy that sometimes people can have conflict and with only seven members if we have if we lose more than two people then we don't have a quorum so i don't know thanks tracy so i i, I would put the call for everybody if you know if anyone and i don't know how come we advertise um if so you know that somebody might have an interest um again to contact the jury marilyn best you have your hand you're muted. Just for those of us who don't know, what is GOL? Oh, sorry. So GOL is one of the subcommittees of the council. It's the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. And the jurisdiction of creating the DAB falls under them. Okay, thank you. Um, 
and so the the so based on the current membership of this committee that there's currently nobody from precinct um sorry from district four which i believe is uh precincts five and nine and then there's only one member from district five which is precinct seven and eight that's south amherst and so if anybody was to apply they need to be like from one of those two districts like because the other districts the way the committee was structured in the rules is you can't have more than two members and we already have two members each from district i mean districts one two and three so i mean i don't know i i mean i know a lot of politically active people in south amherst so i don't know if any of them would want to join and it seems that uh district four might be a little harder because I don't even think they have like a slate of candidates yet for the uh for the council seat but who knows it's tough I reached out to a few people too and um they weren't interested okay so if you have friends in South Amherst or this district four please let them know it's gonna be fun uh <laughs> Oh, it is. It's fun it's already. A, yeah. It's fun already. <laughs> I, I like. I like it. Okay. Um, so now we get into the meat of the subject. So we have all the package material, and I even don't know where to start. Maybe I must confess we have a lot of information to digest. Um, but I think one of the big items in the package was the email from that Mike posted that the full census data is gonna be released tomorrow. So we won't be working with preliminary data, but with full data. So that gives us some uh, one month, almost a month of wiggle room compared to what we have in the past. So I have a question about that. Um, what does that look like when that gets released? Like, will will we see it tomorrow, or will the state see it tomorrow? Or so um, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> but what's happening tomorrow is the Census Bureau is is claiming that the data is going to be released on their website, on the Census Bureau's website. In the past, what that's meant is their website crashes because 176 million people are, are, are trying to get on their website and get, get the data and do exactly what we're trying to do. They're, every city and town in the country is trying to get, in, get online and, and download their data so that they can start working on stuff. I would just say, I don't know if it will be available tomorrow, but you know, within by the time we meet next week, we will have maps that show how many people are in each census block. You know, I can start running those statistics that you folks asked for last week that said, okay, for the 2020 census, how many people are currently in district one? How many are in currently in district, our current district boundaries? I can start producing map products like that. Um, and then we can also start reviewing those on a digital map together. Um, but, um, so it will be available to us as as early as tomorrow i would i would say probably on friday or early next week and then the other the other component of my email that i forwarded to the um to the meeting packet materials is the state is automatically going to produce another map for us i don't know if you guys caught that um whether we want them to or not just like they produced the, the 12 precinct map back in May and the 15 precinct back in May, they're gonna create another one for us as a baseline for us to use if we want to. Um, and it's gonna be using the real data this time. So um, so that, that will probably be the first visual um, representation of the data that we will see, unless I can get my act together and produce something faster. And and will it have fifteen precincts likely? I think it has to. Okay. I I mean that's up to us as a committee, but I don't think we can split a precinct. I don't think you can split a precinct across district boundaries. I looked at I looked at a bunch of other cities and towns around the Commonwealth. Cambridge has 
11 wards, which are the equivalent of our district, and they have 33 precincts and they all perfectly nest. Worcester does the same. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we're allowed to split precincts and I don't even know if we would want to consider it. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Tracy. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I do have a related question to that. And I mean, this is getting a little into the weeds in terms of what's in the packet and so on. But, you know, as we look, as we look towards like how to create the precincts and update the precincts for this time and including adding five precincts, if that's what we have to do. Um, so my understanding, you know, is that you need to split up the precincts like along center lines of road and like other features, but it seems pretty hard when there's certain parts of town where there's all like subdivision roads and it would really make sense for like, you know, say you have two subdivisions off a main road for like one subdivision to go into one precinct and maybe, you know, for the numbers or whatever, and then the other subdivision to go in the other precinct. And so what are the other defining features? Like, I don't know, streams or yes. whatever. Like what are the other lines that we can legitimately like split the precinct we're, by? We're, su we're, supposed to, we're supposed to follow census block boundaries. So those census block boundaries follow those those features that you're describing: roads, um, streams, uh, big big like power line cuts. You right. know the, the the not little tiny telephone or like the bike the paths big ones. or like the bike. Uh, so, yeah, I think well, the bike paths. So as long as I guess so, the question is: so if the census blocks are split up along those lines, then we can use the census block boundaries to do our splits as well. That's what we're supposed to do, oh. correct? Yes. But that's good because there's a lot of blocks compared to. Right. Correct. Correct. So, I was wondering. I cannot share on the, this computer um, the census blocks you send. That's part of the package, right? Um. That. I sent a, there is a packet material item called estimated persons per block that is using the estimated data. It's big caveat there. Um, but that shows roughly what the census blocks look like, the geography of the census blocks. There you go. Um, so you see the gray lines in, well, some of the gray lines are streets, but um, if you look in, in kind of Northeast Amherst, where there's like a, a faint purple, the kind of, there's kind of just random lines yes. in there. Those are those are census blocks. So that was one of the questions because there seem to be some very small places uh, like up on the right corner that are less density. Those are small census blocks. Do you know the correspondence of each color? I, I'm sorry, can you zo zoom in to what zoom you're talking further? about? Sure. Or who so or to the right, Northeast, I believe. In the um, uh, yes, over the. Are you talking about the tan color that's to the that's to the yeah right? to, to the color on the right that is like an island in between the purple. Is yeah. that an uh, a census block on its yes. own? A very small census block, and then the purple is a big census block. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, and we can think the other question I have is the maroon uh, of North Pleasant Street. All that is one census block or that, multiple census blocks? That is correct, Irina. You, that is a great point. Like between North Pleasant and East Pleasant Street, that the big maroon blob that's right there in the middle, yes. um, that is like that is all one census block because there is no defining feature that goes north south in between that block that you can split it up into two. And what's crazy about that is um, it affects the subdivision there. Uh, I believe that's is that Harlow and Van Meter yeah. um, Drive. And then on the North Pleasant side, there's, oh, what's the name of the, there's a small oh. apartment complex. Pastor. I forget the name of it. No, Puffton's on the west side of North Pleasant, but there's a small apartment complex on the north, the east side of North Pleasant Street that's lumped in there with the subdivision on off of East Pleasant Street. And there's nothing that we can do about that. 
Okay. We, you uh, can't, we cannot redraw census block boundaries. And then the <laughs> census block goes across the street. Is the same one or is a different one? It's a, it's a separate one. Okay. Uh, yes. So then we're going to need to identify. Sure. Uh, so and I do have a, just a question too about, so that, um, I mean, and I am assuming like once, Mike, you get the data, the updated data, and have had a chance like to look at it that you would send us some sort of version of this like with the updated estimates right well at what's going to be level. what's going to be really great when we get the real data is i'm actually going to publish an online interactive map uh, okay so that you guys can go in there you can zoom in and zoom out and you can click on a census block and it will highlight and you can see how okay. many people are in there and okay. once i get that i'm going to publish that immediately as soon as we can have it um, oh god and then we can we can start when we start creating our draft maps we can load those in there so that we can see it the public can see it we can interact right. with it um and it's more than just this static map that we're looking at so that's yeah. that's the goal i mean so i mean one challenge i saw with looking at this map so my sort of estimate was based on those preliminary numbers that the census bureau was saying that amherst has a population of forty one thousand five hundred people and that if we're doing 15 precincts, then we're looking estimated population per precinct of about 2,800 people. And then, but on the map, that this map that is showing on the screen, that that top category, like with the densest parts are, is 700 up to 700 plus, like up to the 1727. But to actually know, I mean, it makes a big difference if you're trying to get to 2,800, like if those, are 700 or the 1700 correct. <laughs> so, correct. yeah so um i mean even if there's a map that is being published like a you know like a pdf static version for the public to look at if to differentiate that a little bit more just yeah to, on that top end but sure okay. um i see hands of marilyn and peggy marilyn. so i have a question Will, can the Census Bureau change the existing census blocks, or is this already set in stone? The I'm census block? Some, yeah, I'm looking at, for example, at Echo Hill, which is black, or any of those that are black. Is there any possibility that they will change those boundaries? Um, not anytime soon. Um, okay. I believe that they're only changed in between. So, like, I imagine it's usually like every five years after the census, they start reaching out to cities and towns to redraw block boundaries for the next census. Um, it has to be like a emergency. Wow, there was a very big egregious mistake to redraw a census block. And it it's not very common, for, it's, is my understanding. Can I clarify the Peggy, sorry, I'm gonna go in between one second. I think that in the minutes of the 2011, district advisory board, there was some notes about requesting splitting some census blocks because they had too many people. And I think they, there was a whole process and there is, on the minutes, there's a description about doing that because some of the census blocks were over 3,000 people. It was the south, and, Southwest dorms. Yes. yes. And I think what that resulted in is if you go and you start looking at the maps and stuff for Amherst that were created back in 2011, they aren't in August, September, July, they're in January. So they were actually doing this process, what we're doing right now. They, I think they started in May or something, but they weren't actually redrawing the stuff in until January, um, probably because they were waiting to hear back from the Census Bureau. Okay, sorry, Peggy. So um, I, this actually speaks maybe a little bit to the tenth item on the agenda, but but we have the map here now. When I look at that census block between Northeast Street and East Pleasant Street, I see what fingers and tails—the very thing that the state said that we're not allowed to do—and um, and yet they're kind of forcing our hand. So I guess the question is, when when the different um, standards are mutually exclusive, like you're not allowed to have fingers and tails, but you have to follow the census block boundaries and on what which things get priority how do we decide which is more important i know i understand that census blocks rule over everything else but in terms of the other possible things like in terms of five percent population versus fingers and tails and things like that 
my understanding is that you cannot be over that plus or minus 5%, that you cannot be over 4,000 people. So if there's truly nothing that you can do to, other than creating a finger or a tail, I think it would, we'll do that. I think we would have to produce it with the finger and the tail, and then we send it to the state and the state reviews it. And the, what is it? There's another body that reviews the maps and says thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, yeah. But I know, that, I know that that plus or minus 5% and that 4,000 and not following census blocks, those three are hard stops. Like if you, if you do those three, if you do any of those three, your map is going to be rejected right away, I believe. Um, Mike? Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tracy, you probably had your hand up before me. Oh, go ahead, Dee. I've talked before. Um, so can you scroll down to the bottom there for South Amherst? Um, I see everything pretty detailed and lay labeled within the uh, top part of the map and the mid part. Um, can you scroll? To yeah. Okay, further down, please. Yeah, that's me, by the way. Yep, that's as far oh, as I go. Okay, well, right there. So I see Hampshire College outlined and Bay Road, which um, I live near there. Um, can you point to where is that large purple sector to the right? Is that supposed to be Amherst Woods? It's not labeled. No, that's Middle Street. That's middle. That's like Mount Pollock's area. Um, okay. That's that's like uh, Mechanic Street on the south, Bay Road, um, Middle Street up to I don't know the name of it. It goes by a cemetery and then Southeast Street. So it. And that's where is that purple. It? Woods. Amherst Woods is if you scroll up, Sue. It's over to the right beneath Echo Hill. It, isn't that the south of the line? Yeah. Okay, so that's near Echo Hill. And so what we're looking at are two districts after Amherst College. Those are all clumped together as two districts. One a kind of a longish one to the left, and then this uh, larger one. That's more width. And can you go scroll ahead. back down the screen, Sue? Can we make it? I'll make it a little smaller. There we go. Or maybe we can give. We can let Mike drive or something. But <laughs> I, oh, I've got it on mine. So <laughs> okay. keep going. Well, down where Dee was talking about. Okay, back down to the bottom. I mean, aren't some? Of, I'm assuming that some of the large, like shapes, like as Mike was saying about Mount Pollock, are just because there's not that many people there. And so, and like some of it, you know, isn't developed or something. And, and that's a census block. And so that, that that's a, that's a, right. that's an, that's a census block. That's, there's nothing that we can do about splitting the people up inside that, that purple area. But like, there's only like two, a couple of streets in there anyway. So there might not be right. that many people. Yeah. What's the white? Um, white is no data, Irina. I didn't, I was struggling to get this map. I couldn't. <clears throat> I said I would get this map out on Friday and I didn't get it out until Monday. So I was struggling with the no data. So I just made it white. <laughs> okay. Oh. So does that actually reflect places that people don't live primarily? Is that well, correct? Again, this is the estimated data. Oh, so got folks, it. Okay. Let's, that's the big no, caveat fine. here. <laughs> this is, this is, this was the, the reason that I produced this map and not the other ones, the other ones that show people per district as of the current districts and people per precinct is this just shows the relative density of people within census blocks that we might get this data tomorrow and or yeah tomorrow and it might show that we don't have 41,000 people in Amherst it might show we have 45,000 people and the relative density is probably still the same the map is probably going to look very similar to this with little changes we might also get this the data tomorrow, and we ha still have thirty nine thousand people, which means we don't need twelve district precincts. We still need ten. Um, there's a lot of stuff that kind of hinges on the balance of these of the data that gets delivered to us. So don't, you know, this was just as a discussion point for Gosh. us to look at those apartment complexes, the boulders. Look at how many. That's one census block. That dark census block right there. Um, there's nothing we can do about the 1,000 plus people in there. We can't split them up and, and divide them into different areas. Yeah, so I had a question about that, like with the polygon. So 
if would there be like two i mean how can you tell the boundaries of one next to the other if they're the same color or does that not happen very much do you like um like so the point that you just brought up about how the boulders and mm -hmm. because there's actually i think like there's four complexes in there there's mill valley and the brook and the boulders right. and south point they're all in there and that you said that's all one block one census block well it's it's almost all one block um you see the the, the letter shape Oops. Oh. making it bigger um there's a letter there's a little drive that kind of enters off of east hadley road and it forms right. the shape of the letter u yeah. There's a and there's a medium shade of purple and a light yeah. lavender inside of that. Those are two separate blocks. Okay. Those are two. They're they. One has very few people in it, and the other is a part of the boulders that has a good number of people. So in it. I think that that purple, the darker purple, is probably the brook. It, the brook That's... is over on the east side, but then it wraps all the way around. It includes part of the boulders, oh, and it includes okay. all of. It used to be called South Point, but it just was rebranded to be Renew. Right. Um, so it it includes complexes. It includes all parts of all three complexes, um, and there's a, there's a fair amount of people in there. I think Renew is like the owner because now Greensleeve says Renew too, but oh. um, uh. I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. So one thing is, I know you sent us the the list of like new developments and so on, including like yep. some of the new UMass dorms, but when we're doing this process, I mean, we can be aware of those, I guess, but aren't aren't our census precincts supposed to be based on like what's currently there and the 5% and so on? Like we don't actually, is there any point in this process where we're formally incorporating the data on the new units or the projected new units? I'll have to go back and read the presentation. Um, it would have been in last week's packet materials, and I believe it's called, it's the re precincting PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, it's a long PowerPoint slide, and it, go through there and read it. I, I'm not sure the language that they say. It, it's something to the effect of you should consider new developments and how developable an, a, an area is when you're drawing a precinct boundary. Um, but I, I guess at the same time though, like in terms of the actual figures about who, who right. lives in the places, like we're bound by the census block Correct. data. Correct. So that's not in there. <laughs> yeah, I just don't. And we're supposed to stay within 5%, like the case of like the UMass dorms that are gonna be like in the center of campus. Um, right. which are replacing, of course, like the ones in North Village, right. and things, but I think they're like higher density and there's more units, but right. I, I mean, we shouldn't, it doesn't seem like there's a lot we can do. Like, do we keep that precinct much smaller in anticipation of those? It, it, we can, so Tracy, we cannot keep it much smaller because they have to be within 5%, all of them. So that, I, that's what I'm saying. If it has so, to be within 5%, yeah. But one thing that we can do, and this is part of the discussion, we should go uh, on the other items when we set priorities. Maybe we should take this into account when we are creating the districts to make sure that if there are new developments that they all not fall in the same district or they don't all fall in the same precinct. That, I, that would be my suggestion. I don't know how the rest of the committee, but maybe to try to think, okay, thinking forward, okay, we don't want 500 new uh, rooms in all falling in one precinct or in one district. We want to make sure that when we create the maps, we take this into account and somehow, if possible, we try to figure out to make sure that they fall in different yeah, no, I just brought that one up because that one is estimated to be 600 beds. Yeah. But so, then, I mean, as opposed to like summing up a whole bunch of different projects, like, anyway, but, yeah, but I mean, so that might be the, 600 here, 200 there. So I no, think you try to make sure that we don't have the 600 and the 200 falling in the same. Yeah. But so I guess, so Mike, on that, in terms of complexes, like if there is, I mean, there, the census blocks don't ever break up like a building or something like Southwest dorms or like they're actually separate structures. Is that correct? 
That's correct. So. Yes. And can I throw out before you guys get on a roll on something else? Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to invite every one of you to come into the office, you know, one at a time um, and look through the old binder that's been put together from 2011. There's a lot of material in there. It might be very helpful just to know what the last group was up against. Um, I wrote down just a couple key points and they had said that, um, you know, the one single block had 4506 students in it. That was the Southwest and how it severely restricts the ability to draw the precinct lines, um, of course, which we're already discussing, but they also encountered some errors in the block population that, that, that they got from the Census Bureau. Um, so something to be on the lookout for. There was one block that said it had 225 people in it that was actually a woodland and parking lot. Yep. Um, and also 31% of the town's population lives on just 2% of the total land area. So um, some of the difficulties, but it, it was very helpful. I went through that whole binder again today and looked at everything and it was just, a, I think it'd be very helpful if you wanna come in, I'd be happy to share it. Marilyn has her hand raised. Yeah. yeah. I think so much of what we're talking about now is speculative and I think we'd probably be better off deferring this discussion until we see the actual data, just my suggestion. I mean, I think there are certain things we want to anticipate, but it could be that um, all of these issues or many of these issues will be resolved once we see the data. Okay, Mike, can I request that when you make the map, I don't know if it's possible, can you make the numbers so that it doesn't go from 700 to 1700? Yes, absolutely. And then, that, and that's then, what I had asked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, maybe also having a different color, the census blocks to make sure that if you have two areas that have the same population density, that we are able to identify that there are different census blocks. Um, maybe it doesn't yeah. happen. No, it does. It does. And there should be a boundary there. I think what's really confusing is that the the secondary roads are light gray and so are the boundaries between census blocks. So I think that's what's throwing everybody's Maybe eyes off. Blue. But I don't know. Yeah. So I'll 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 definitely tweak that and make it better. I was I was just trying to get this out very okay. quickly on Monday. The, as a proof of concept. Thanks. Do you have your hand? Yeah, so I appreciate that, Mike. So we have some of this data. I appreciate, um, you know, the urgency. It would help, I think, to visually see the overlay of the pre the current precincts sure. uh, and districts, and then the population. Um, that would be tremendously helpful for for next time. But I, I do know you're trying to you know to work within some some tight deadlines. Yep, that is a that is a great point, and I will one hundred. When you start adding lots and lots and lots of different lines and colors to maps, like unless it can really confuse some people. So I tried to keep it simple here, but next time, I'll make you go crazy with all the different colors. You'll see. Oh, maybe well, do add them that, in layers so that you have different yeah. versions that you add the complexity so that we can. Yeah. Well, and just yeah, I mean the the total population for each of the. So I know that the the in some of the materials that were sent out, it did show I guess the state's versions of the maps that they had generated on the based on twelve precincts and fifteen precincts. It did show the two thousand and ten population for each of the precincts, right? So I guess that would be helpful. I mean, not to add it all to the map because I know that the map can get kind of crazy, but even just to see how the 2010 population for each of the 10 existing precincts compares to the 2020 population for each of the precincts. Like in terms of how much we're gonna to need to like tweak things around. Yep. So. Yeah, I'm making notes, I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> okay. Well, it should oh. be pretty exciting when you get the new data. <laughs> I hope so. I hope it. I hope we don't find people that are that are in a in a wetland or in a parking lot like we read. Um, but that that is exactly what I heard another um, town say about the estimated data. They found errors in it. So, um, and I, I'm betting that that's why Amherst, the their maps that they were drawing in 2011, were actually done in 2012 
if you go down and look at the bottom of the map, some of them were done in January. I think that's probably because they found those errors and they, mm. they found that, that one single census block that violated the census's own rules about the number of people that can be in a precinct. Um, there was also an ongoing error from 2000. There's a whole history in this binder, truly really fascinating. Yeah. In 2000, there were a bunch of errors that were supposedly corrected. And then they found out when they got the new material in 2010 that they were never corrected. And they had to submit all kinds of, it took, there's, Sandra documented the whole thing. It's about, mm. yeah, a gazillion pages long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. oh, and did Marilyn have to leave? Yeah, I was just raising my hand to say, to remind people that Marilyn had to leave at five and I think she just stepped up. Yep, okay. she did. We still have a quorum though. Yes. Do I'm, I'm sorry, do we still have a quorum of voting members? Yes, we do. Yes. Five. Five. Last time we were fun. But Marilyn's not here, so now we only have four. No, 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 no. We, no. we still have five. You count have yourself. Five. <laughs> okay, three, four, five. Yeah, you're right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's too long. Um uh okay. That's okay. good. So I I want to say um we have a question about the material, the potential developments. This is all that we know of that is going. Um, I'm trying to go through the package. So the first question is, anybody has any questions about the map? And we want any request for next time beyond the ones that we had asked Mike now. I mean, it seems really helpful to have that information. I mean, I guess it's helpful to know like when they're going to come online, but it is, I guess if it's going to be in the next 10 years, then that would influence it. I mean, some yeah. of these projects oh, these, are going to be these sooner projects. Than, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then some of these yeah. projects are going to be sooner than others, I guess. Yeah. Some of them, you know, 26 spring street, it's, it's in the middle of downtown. It's been in its current state for what, two years. Um, but so, they were they were advertising for renters for the fall, but yeah. <laughs> I park my car there every day, and, and oh, <laughs> there's okay. nobody there working on it. Um, so I I I can ask that those questions. As you see there, there's still some things that I have not heard back from the planning department. Um, uh, there's still you know so, number metrics about the number of people and the number of units, as well as notes. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting on hearing back from that. If there's other data points that you want me to ask, like what, what did you say? Uh, estimated time of completion? Is that what you're thinking? Well, just in terms of, right, if it's going to be during this decennial census cycle <laughs> compared to like, you know, after 10 years. Uh, yeah. I would yeah, and I think, I think we can take the eruptor off, but it's useful just for people to know that it's sure. not. Um, but and so there is some North Amherst project with Cinta Jones, I guess, an additional <laughs> one. Or is that expansion of her current one? I don't know. Oh, okay. I have no idea. Some of these things, I the, my understanding is that some of these things are, they're anywhere in the development cycle, right? Some of them are conceptual. Okay. Okay. Some of them are like 26 Spring Street. They're actually being built, you know? And some mm -hmm. of them are in all flavors of in-between. So we can okay. ask i i would say if it's on this list we should make the assumption that it's going to be completed in the next 10 years i would say um i don't yeah that's just my gut instinct okay. and so this north village and lincoln apartments so mm -hmm. is that is that so that's um replacing the current yeah, oh, yeah, they're they're moving. My understanding is that they're moving people out of there, and then they're going to tear it down and build back. So I don't I don't live in North Amherst. I don't. So know. those two are um, North uh, North Village is already empty. That's the family housing. The mm -hmm. students, the post, the grad students, and post of the family housing, they've been moved to other complexes in the area, and. That one, I think, is coming up soon. Um, it should have yeah. started construction last year. But they the were Lincoln, using it for COVID housing. No, Lincoln Apartments were using for COVID housing. Okay. No, but uh, North Village, too. That's what I heard. But uh, I don't know. Maybe, Joseph, you know more. But um, They were both. OK. So I think um, that put that delay. Um, 
but those two should be larger than what it was in the past. So I'm wondering if these two UMass dorms are on top of this. And I'm thinking by the address they are, or is it Lincoln Apartments? No, I, my under, sorry, Tracy, go, go ahead. ahead. You, go. you might, you might know more than I do. Being oh, a, I mean, I believe that they're like, it's going to expand significantly, okay. like into the parking lot as well. Lincoln Apartments are not very big. Okay. And so that's why there's been like all that other construction in that vicinity. That's that's my understanding yeah. as well, and Tracy. That the parking lots just south of Mass Ave, mm -hmm. that they're going to be two, um, two dorms there. Um, um, we lost a member. I just noticed. Okay, so we don't have quorum. One, we don't two, have quorum right now. Four. Oh nope. no, we still have the five. That's what Where's we're talking Tammy? about. Two, three, four. No. Four. Six, seven. Oh, we lost wait, Tammy. We lost, lost Tammy. Tammy. Let me just. But now, weren't you? Wasn't somebody going to join at five or something? No, Marilyn had a leave. Marilyn was leaving. Yeah. Oh, I thought. To, oh, Tammy's to... still here. Okay, there back. she is. Okay. Um, and that the North Village project is like higher density too. Okay. So, so I'm thinking along the lines of what Marilyn said that yeah. unless we actually have real information here, mm -hmm. this discussion doesn't help very much. So, no, sure. um. Great. So I, I guess the question is, how do we find out, how do we fill in the blanks here? Is that something that we do? Is that something you do, Mike? Is that? Uh, no, that's, I don't know. I don't know any of this information. I've, I've delegated this to the people that know, and okay. I've followed up with them a number of times and I'll just keep, I'll keep following up with them until we get this thing completely populated. I mean, I guess. I mean, my suggestion would probably be that we focus on the census data we do have on the precinct Correct. level, and yes. we do these rough cuts of breaking up everything into the precincts, and then we can consider this table, but I'm not sure like exactly how much it can influence unless we have like firm numbers or right. firm info right. on it. I, my suggestion would be that once we have the, the a preliminary maybe precincts, we should take into account that the big ones, the smaller ones, it's going to be harder, but maybe the big ones that uh, we know that the UMass dorms don't fall in the same, the same one. Because we know that those ones are going to be big. So yeah, as much as possible, try to put them in different, put the lines so that they but don't Definitely. Fall. Well, like for example, the East Street School, like that's not going to be a big project. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, I think they're, redevel they're redeveloping the building. Yeah. I think there's just not that much room there. Mm -hmm. Mike. Okay. So, Mike. Um, okay. Thanks. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have a question. When you say you're you're outreaching to folks about this information, particularly for this chart and the uh, the building timeline, or you, Nate should have like you know permitting process. It has to go through this process to see how close these particular projects are to right. our timeline so that we can you know at least account for the ones that have gone through the permitting processes and are more of a sure thing and not theoretical is there a way to get that information and in, input here as peggy yes. said okay yeah i, I think, think that i think that's a great idea to add that so i'm putting that on my list thank you Thanks. Um, any other items that we want to discuss from the packet? Yes, Mike. So one, so one thing I do want to say about this, um, like Tracy mentioned, you know, we have to focus on the census block data. The, you know, if if we get all of our numbers below four thousand and plus or minus five percent and we don't consider this at all, the Census Bureau is going to say thumbs up, you know, or the, the state and the LE, I forget the acronym. There's another agency that reviews it. Um, it they're gonna give us a thumbs up. But I think one of the things we'll probably see when we get the new census data and I overlay it on top of the current districts and the current precincts, we're going to see that oh, this precinct grew really fast during this 10 year period. And it's now well over 4,000 people and it's well over 4% or 5% larger than its surrounding 
um, precincts. And um, so when, when you do take these types of developments into consideration when drawing these precinct boundaries, what it could potentially do is 10 years from now when there's another DAB in place, they may not have to consider redrawing that boundary because we considered that development in 2021. Yes, 2021. So. I agree, we want something that is resilient to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Tracy. So I have a question, Mike, about the 5%. You're talking about the 4,000, but my read of the rules, and you know much better than I do, is that, again, like just based on this calculation about having 15 precincts and having, you know, 2,800 to 3,000 people a precinct, does the 5% based on that or is the 5% based on the 4,000? The it's... Um what we do is you take the total number of people that are in Amherst, mm -hmm. you divide it by the number of precincts that you have, mm -hmm. and whatever that number is. Yeah, it's 2,800 right 2, now. 2,800. Right. The plus or five, the plus or minus 5% is, is 140. Is that 2,800? Is the 2,800? Is so it's not really the 4,000, right? No. So like no, if the four we had some that were like 3,000, that the, the state would have an issue with that. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yes. So. The four thousand is the cap. Like you absolutely, no, we can never have more than four thousand people in a census in a precinct. Got it. Thanks. So, I regarding that question, what if the? I, I guess okay. I'm gonna wait until next week and we we'll see the data. I was thinking, what happens if it comes that the current population is thirty nine thousand nine hundred people. Um, but I'm gonna wait until next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it? tomorrow. Maybe I'll publish a map tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Send us a, a, a send us a, a, an email to everybody. We have yeah. this amount of people. Right? Yeah. Posted. Um, so I okay. would just mention. I know you were asking about the packet. I know that I put in some of the information from the um, charter, and I just threw that in there just to show people, you know, I'd offered to look it up. I don't really think it's that relevant to our process. So one thing with the charter is the charter's task, at least in terms of the districts, was much simpler than ours because they were working with the precincts that already existed based on the 2010 census. And their only decisions about the boundaries was about how to turn those 10 precincts into the five districts. And based on the requirements about having precincts be next to each other and so on, and given the shape of Amherst and the shape of those precincts, there were only, I think, like up to like nine options of how they could pair it and get everything to work. And so, you know, they didn't have to like, we're kind of at a you know, we're at a much earlier sort of harder stage where we need to also look at like all the different factors that go into like creating the precincts in the first place. And then, and then once we feel comfortable with our kind of draft 15 precincts, then doing what they did, you know, in terms of putting them into the districts, at least that's how I see it, but so. I, and I had, I'm the type of person where I I'll think of something really good to say as soon as we hang up this meeting, or I'll think of it tomorrow, or I'll think of it when I'm putting my kid down to bed at night. Um, I thought of something the other day, and Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure if the town council has to sign off on our precinct map. I think they have to sign off on the district map. The district, yeah, it's it's right in the uh, charge. So um, let me read it to you. So. But we're so, drawing the districts off of the precincts. But when we think when we were talking last week about our very aggressive timeline, like we're going to get this data at the end of September, we have two weeks to produce something so that it can get on the town council's time. We can schedule it with the council. They can review it and give them a buffer to reject it and us do it again. I don't know if we have to worry about that with the precincts because the precincts are for the LEDRC. Correct. Council, we're recommending districts. Yeah, you're on mute, Tracy. I read the press release from the Census Bureau mm -hmm. and, and it seems like, right, that 
if these are being for, put forth as the precincts that the executive body or, you know, like somebody still needs to approve them at the town level. Okay. Not just the, I mean, that was my take on what I read and. I, I don't think it would hurt, but I, I don't think it says anything. I mean, just that it, we're not like an authority, you know, we're, we have no authority per se. Right. Like in terms of like final decisions, I feel like it does need to be approved somehow at the yeah. top level. Okay. We have to but. we have to talk about the polling locations where those extra mm. five precincts, if there are five, are going to be voting in, and then it'll be up to the council to vote on those. But again, it's a recommendation. But I think that comes from the board of registrars. I think one thing leads to another leads to another with this. Yes. Yes. So I can give an update. I did email the town council clerk requesting that we are put in the agenda and in um, requesting an extra meeting so that they can vote on this. And I have not heard back. Athena's on vacation, so uh, it's possible. I might also suggest, well, if you re-email Athena, but also to email the council president. Okay because um, she's usually pretty good about getting back to people. Yeah. And then, and I don't think, I think Athena is the clerk. I don't think she has like authority to decide about meetings or anything. So it would have to be approved by the council okay. members themselves. Yeah, she's just your first contact person though, because she'll get everything off to the council. But um, yeah, Lynn is, Lynn is good. But so I guess one thing, right, is like with the election is that the council usually meets on Monday. So their last meeting that we saw on the schedule was October 18th. And then, um, so they could maybe have a meeting on October 25th, but then it wouldn't be realistic for them to have a meeting like before the day before the election. No. I asked, so, no, I asked yeah. on the, on the, in fact, because we have to put it before the end of October in. So I asked for the 25th that week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when there's deadlines like that, I think the council is usually pretty accommodating and they can also just have a meeting where this is the only topic or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they do have a procedure that says that any of these substantive things, they need to see it twice. So it would be good, but they can choose to waive that if they, if they all agree, which I think in this case for public input, they wouldn't. Okay. So any other discussion that we want to have about the package material? So, so Sue, I just had a question about um, from 2011. So the only thing that's online and available to us from that process is um, just those emails. The I'm minutes? sorry, the minutes, the minutes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I don't, I mean, I think it's great if everybody wants to go and look through all your, I mean, are there any other like digital materials that did would you, be available? Did you check um, archive materials? Did you well, look under like archives boards and or Archives are usually based on what's in the committees. I like don't know. On the, old, like, on the old DAB page, see if they had anything on that page. Is there know. a new old, is there an old separate there old new DAB? Old? Is, there a, <laughs> is there a separate DAB page? Yeah, let me look. A lot of times the archive part is just minutes and agendas. Um, but then I noticed like with the charter, when I was looking for the charter information, they still have like a whole page about that has a recap of like the materials that they use at each of their meetings. This may take me a while here. However, I, there's not something, it's not stuff that I can put online. It's too, um, there's big maps and things like that. No, so. I didn't know if there's like any part of it that, that's helpful like even so one of the things is like for example the minutes they refer to like different scenarios and things like mm -hmm. things that we don't really have access to but i don't know or maybe one of us can volunteer to look through and see if there's anything that's easy to like scan in or something hmm. i mean my main takeaway from looking at least at the minutes is just that it sounds like the state redistricting committee whatever they're called the local redistricting 
LADRC? LA, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that they um that they would have questions like if we do have things with like little as Peggy was mentioning about like fingers, like mm -hmm. different parts protruding, and they wanted explanations about those. So I can see them doing the same to us. Yeah, cool. that's the kind of stuff that's in this binder. Yeah, basically what happened. Well, it was mostly to correct that problem from 2000. Um, and, and just the way we have to deal with the, you know, intense blocks of large groups of people that it's hard to break up. So, um, and then, and then conversely, huge amounts of space with very few people in it in Amherst, you know, like if you look at South Amherst, there's, there's just, you know, it's all conservation land and it's got 20 houses on there, you know, um, and it's an all one census block. It's, it's strange geography. So Tracy, I'll check online because I can't check and talk and listen at the same time, obviously, or apparently. Okay. Okay. If you find anything, can you add it for the package for next week yeah. as a link? Yeah. Great. Um, so this leads to the next item. There's, I think this is, a, I wanted to start the conversation on how and this is what Peggy, you were asking before, how is it gonna set up priorities? What takes over when we are creating the precincts? Um, because there are multiple factors. There are some, as uh, Mike says, that there are the hard stops. They have no more than 4,000, but no more than 5% difference and census block. So those are our starting points. Beyond that, we have a clean slate in, in practice, that's how I see it. So one of the questions that we have to come forward and think is, is it important that we keep as close as possible the current precincts or not? Is it important that we try to distribute the precincts in such a way that as much as we can, we make sure that the final districts have similar population densities? Uh, this is something that was not able to be done in the previous, in the last map creation because they were working on the existing precincts. So one way, or, one way would be, let's look at the population um, density with age profiles and look for similar age profiles and population densities in all districts that within each precinct might not be doable because we might have large connotations, but is it important for us that we have a distribution that they are self-similar? That would be a way, or we start dividing in different ways, the, the precinct. So I think this is a conversation we need to have because we have some hard stops and then we have a lot of things. And I, this is the conversation that we were having the other day. We start with clean slate or we start with what we have right now and just try to tweak what we have. I, so there are a few other things we have to consider. Um, minority vote dilution, you know, we, yeah. according to the, we cannot redraw precincts or ward or district boundaries that result in the dilution of minority group member votes. Um, um, this is all in the presentation that we, and they give examples yeah. of what minority vote dilution. So those are things, um, there's also, um, other cons they're considered other considerations, existing polling place locations, potential polling place locations, communities of interest, and, and then this is where they also mention new construction. Those are other considerations that you should take into play. Um, and then the second thing, what you were talking about there, um, Irina, is I talked to a, a guy in California today who's like a re-precincting and redistricting expert like he helps he's a consultant and he helps cities and towns all over and he said the question that you just asked is the hardest one to answer <laughs> and that is do you start with what you have or do you wipe it clean and start from from scratch and he's like it so his his experience has been that starting from scratch is really difficult um I would still want to put it on the table because I think in Amherst, I think from my point of view, I would like to know how other college towns handle things because mm -hmm. the way our form of government is such that we have to have two representatives per district. And if we end up with a district that is mostly 
on 95% students. Um, we have one now in the committee, but it's harder to have part of the representation in, in town. So that's why I was pointing, okay, if we have similar age profiles, we might be able to have a better, um, like the permanent residents and, and students might be a better, uh, in a different way of doing things. I don't know a better way, but it would be a different consideration to take into account. Um, just because of how our form of government is and we are limited by the, um, that was my line of thought when I was suggesting that, but that. When we see that we don't have, even in this committee representation from some districts, right? Um, but maybe that's too polemic. So I, I know it's harder and I think we have to figure out, but I, that's what I wanted to put it up in the table. Sure. Tracy, you have a hand, you have a hand? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I had a question. I mean, maybe we could like each kind of offer thoughts on it. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, one one thing I was thinking about is that I do think that we will, there will be some precincts that are predominantly students. And I know that the 2011 redistricting committee that they were trying not to have like the precinct 10 be all students, um, but it's pretty close. Um, but I think so for some of these questions that you're raising, it seems like some of them could also be addressed at a district level because the district level is like the main sort of building block for the town, the form of government we have now in terms of district representation. So like even if you did have a precinct that was predominantly students, you would hopefully match it with other precincts that weren't predominantly students too, like for more diversity. And so I think that's some of what that the Charter Commission tried to do when they took the precincts and they, you know, moved them to create the district, looked at them to create the districts. I mean, one, I mean, my one thing when I've been looking at the stuff that Mike sent, you know, the maps and so on, I mean, one, one approach I might suggest that I've seen work on other committees I've been on, not that we've looked at population per se, but even just spending a few meetings like going through like different parts of town you know starting at the north or starting at the south and just you know and as a group and i mean i mike's you know offered or you know if we can have some interactive map or something to like start to kind of roughly draw some precincts and see you know how those populations are looking and then sort of move through the town to try to approximate it and then kind of go back and fine tune it and and look at some of these other issues too. Because, I mean, one of the main things the Census Bureau is looking at, right, are the total counts. So even if we have these other factors in mind, like we need to look at the total counts too. And I mean, I'm assuming that some of the precincts won't have changed population that much. Like even if our population did go up as much as the Census Bureau says, which is like 2000 people, like some of the precincts might be pretty close to what they were whereas some will have had a lot of growth and so. Yeah, but the fact that we are increasing the number of precincts, we're gonna to have to lower the number of people. No, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. But I mean, just in terms of like where the changes are or so on. But I, I mean, I was just like conceptually myself as I looked at it kind of like being like, oh, you could shift, you know, you could have a precinct here or there or whatever. like starting to play with it a little bit. And so if that seemed like a good use of the committee's time to maybe spend a few meetings sort of working through town and doing that, yeah. that would be, but that's my suggestion. Peggy, you're muted, Peggy. Um, before doing that, I would suggest that we talk a little bit about whether we want to approach yeah. this from the perspective of keeping the districts as much as we can as they are for continuity versus feeling like, you know what, we have, we have free reign, let's, let's uh, go for it. Mike, I know I'm gonna, you're gonna hate me for asking this. Can we have on the current precincts, um, like uh, the, uh, this age profile or distribution of ages or density histograms of each of the districts, not the precincts, but the districts. The districts using yes. the 2020 data? Yes. Um, assuming that they or, or or the twenty whatever estimate that yeah. they have from the past. 
just so that it gives us an idea how current districts are distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, my hope is that tomorrow when they release the data, it's not just population data, it's socioeconomic data. Uh -huh. okay. um, that, that is what I'm really hoping for so that we can have everything at our fingertips to do exactly what you just described. Because um, I think it would be useful to have different layers of information. Yes. I think for mm -hmm. us, if we minority, I don't know if we can have that information, but maybe yes. socioeconomical distribution of socioeconomical. So one is age distribution on census blocks, maybe. I don't know if at that level or at district level or, or at census level, at the census block level would be great. Correct. And socioeconomic distribution also. I don't know if that is a part of the so data. I, I would hesitate to use the 2010 data um, yeah. to do these maps, but yeah, yeah. my, like I said, I really hope that that comes as part of the release tomorrow so that I can, and when the census releases their stuff, um, each thing, think of it as like an Excel spreadsheet for Amherst. Um, the socioeconomic stuff will be an Excel spreadsheet. The population stuff will be in a different Excel spreadsheet. And um, um, uh, you know, race will be in a different spreadsheet. And, and then I have to take all of that stuff and kind of say, hey, match all of this stuff to that census block. Um, my hope is all that comes out tomorrow or before our next meeting so that we can really play with all that stuff. So I have a question. You are using which software to do create these maps? Um, I use as ESRI products. So um, ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online and different things like that. Um, and I, I use, um, I'm a SQL database person. So I'm always doing stuff in SQL. Okay. But we can make we can make maps and graphs and interactive online maps and graphs and summary charts and there's lots of different things that we can do to provide tools for us to make decisions but then also for transparency's sake you know oh here's here's scenario one two three four five and six that the committee came up with and here's the race distribution for each one of those scenarios and here's the age distribution for each one of those scenarios those are those are tools that we have at our fingertips. I think that would be great to have. And I think part of the discussion that we have to have is, okay, beyond the top, the things that are hard, how do we balance all the other items? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so I had a question, because Peggy, you were just asking about um, the committee needs to decide about whether to keep the districts the same. Is that what your question was? Or, no, was, or were you referring to? I wasn't sure what you were referring to. No, I was trying to say that I, in terms of what uh, whether we approach this, I'm, I'm I guess I'm just curious whether people feel like is there a, a leaning towards trying to keep the committee the districts the same, or is there more a leaning of let's build you know let's build up from the ground? Um, so it was it was just kind of a way. I think it was just a way to start the discussion. Yeah, I mean maybe we can all kind of voice, if you have an opinion on it, they can voice what they think. Yeah. Well, I'll start. <laughs> I think since we're getting the data sooner than we thought, um, that we should uh, at least, I, I would really like to look at the precincts and try to balance and not worry about what the previous um, committees have done and see what we come up with. If we, if we end up with our, you know, if we end up with no time um, or we can't get the data to work or whatever, we can fall back on what has been done before and maybe tweak it. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we have more time than I thought we would. I'd really love to try to, you know, think, go in with an open mind about what we'll come out with. Great. Thanks, Joseph. You have your hands up. I, I totally agree with that. I think one thing we do need to keep in mind is due to our sort of um, low numbers, especially in uh, districts four and five, that if we're not able to sort of get more uh, people on our, our board here that we do use a lot of the older data for those areas specifically. Um, 
However, I do agree with you that I think it's a good opportunity to sort of play with a lot of this new information when we get it. Tommy? I was just going to say, I think there's a value in keeping voting places the same just because it's hard for people to learn new things. And I work in the polls and I spend a lot of time sending people around to other precincts to vote. So I think there's a value in trying to keep it the same. But I also think that once we look at it as a whole picture, that may not be possible. So I think we need to be really open minded, but to keep in mind that for a lot of people here, for a lot of people in general, it's easier to do what you did before. Uh, do you want to give an... Do you have your hand? Yeah, I think there's something to be said about um, you know, making sure that folks know um, where to vote, you know, uh, but but um, I also believe it's an opportunity to look at these growing populations. Demographics is shifting and changing within Amherst. Um, we can simply look at our school system. It's almost 50% um, people of color. And so I would very much be interested in uh, looking at the minority majority uh, type of balance in terms of these precincts and districts. And so, you know, if it takes re, you know, a, a exploring that, um, I'd be in favor of that. Now, of course, I'm just, you know, uh, it, here's the representative and I'm a member. I'm looking at it in a fresh way because the population is changing and shifting would be important. Tracy? Hi, so, um, so I, think, I think that these factors are really important to look at. And I think there's also some good points about uh, precinct, I mean, pre voting locations. And I guess initially my take would be to like sort of start with the precincts that are there and see about how to shift those, particularly as we're moving them from 10 to 15, and also looking at the latest population trends. I think it's really important, um, as I had mentioned earlier in the meeting, just about like subdivisions and neighborhoods and stuff to try to not split those up. Like if you, it's, and it can be a little hard because we're using central lines, right? So like if people on one side of the street vote in one precinct and people on the other side of the street vote on the other precincts, and then, or maybe even, and that could even be a district boundary later. And then people are like, where do I vote? And, you know, and people don't know. And so to just sort of look at like some of those clusters. Um, and so I think, I mean, I might tend to look some of the population figures first and then fill it in and adjust things based on the, all these demographics and factors we're talking about. Um, and in terms of uh, creating the precinct, I mean, sorry, creating the districts after we've agreed about the precincts. I definitely think that we should go through that process ourselves. When I went back and I looked at the Charter Commission's plan and their discussions about how they said that there were nine different options for how they could have grouped the precincts. I mean, there were a few other options that they didn't choose. And in my look at them, I thought that they were just as viable. And in some cases, I could see benefits for the options they didn't choose in some ways. And so, I think that we should go through that process ourselves because it does, because that the districts are now the, you know, the building blocks of the council, it seems really important to get that piece right in terms of, you know, representation and so on. Tommy? I'd also like to say that I'd like to see polling places at um, UMass and at least Amherst College. Um, it's, um, it's very hard to get college students to vote and having the polling places be kind of in more than one place in town has also been really difficult trying to sending people back and forth because the dorms are in different pre in different voting places. And so I would love to see um, UMass have at least one polling place, if not two. And 
I don't know, at, the, at this point, I don't know what, what the Amherst College, I don't know what the numbers are. I also don't, I guess we're not really considering the voting population, we're just considering the general population. So I don't know, but I do, I, I personally feel that the student voters are underrepresented. So they usually, Usually, yeah, so I think that in at UMass, at least early voting for whenever there's early voting, there used to be an early voting place, um, a polling mm -hmm. place uh, at UMass. I we don't know. Them. What? Mm -hmm. Yes. We so have, I don't know. We have one time, right? We had them a couple times. No, right. and, um, we've right. had problems every single time, I have to tell you, um, because the room has to be secure. It has to be um, available. Um, we have to be able to get our stuff in there. You know, um, parking spaces were supposed to be reserved. We have a lot of equipment that we bring in. And I know the last town clerk ended up having to cart stuff probably a good half a mile in to get because the parking spots. There's always been a glitch. Let's just put it that way. You don't need to hear all the particulars, but. Um, and it also has to be available. You know, every single time we have an election, we have to know that that spot's available for us, no matter what is going on on campus. So there, there's issues. You know, we've had the sub precincts over the years. Three times there have been sub sub precincts. Three, four, nine, and ten A were the sub precincts. Um, and because of lack of turnout, they ended up the school ended up contacting us and saying we can't do this because they have to pay a portion of it. Um, yeah. So they've canceled it three times. We've tried it. So I, you know, I see the benefit definitely, but um, then there's also those two hands on this one, two sides of the coin. Yeah, there was I mean, also the bad messaging there, um, where students were told to register to vote, but in their hometowns, and then some students were told to register in the town of Amherst, and so they were thinking that they could vote in Amherst if they registered in their hometown, and so it was like they got a lot of mixed messages. Interesting. Very picky. Yeah. Tracy, you have. I mean, so I, I mean, I can, I can talk about my opinion on polling places as somebody who's worked a lot of elections. I do wonder, like, is the polling place locations, is that actually part of our charge at all? Or is that something that will come later, like after the precincts are created? It, it's not something that we determine ourselves. I don't, no. I don't think so. I don't believe so. I don't, right. I, I, we're supposed to consider their location when drawing these maps, but okay. I don't, I don't think it's our, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, I, I don't believe that it's our responsibility to draw where the polling locations are. No, and that's not my, my interpretation either. I think I spoke to this oh. earlier, Tracy. Right. Um, yeah. It's, I it's mean, something to yeah, think about. Um, definitely. But, I mean, but I guess logistically too, I mean, I do think it's important to Ha for students to have access to voting. Um, but I mean, I know that I've worked as an election worker um, on like the on the on the in the on campus precincts that weren't like early voting, which the early voting included all the precincts, right? So you didn't have to know like which precinct you were in. Right. Um, and that sometimes the turnout, particularly if it's a local election, because unfortunately, um, local elections do not typically draw as many college students to vote as say like a presidential election or something. So, right. I mean, I think I worked one precinct, one election on, on campus in the Cape Cod lounge and we only had like 10 voters for the whole day. So, um, I mean, I think there's a balance and it will also be important to see what happens at the state level about allowing um, like vote by mail and early voting, including for local elections because a pretty good, a pretty high percentage of people like voted remotely or early last time. And so, I mean, a part of me wonders, you know, the extent to which like day vote, voting the day of the election will like continue to draw people. I mean, I personally will always continue to vote like on person the day of the election, but I mean, a lot of people just like the convenience of not doing that. Yeah, so. I see seeing, yeah, definitely. So going back to the discussion about the priorities, I think to think it took out the polling places is good, but I wouldn't, we don't need to keep them the same. Besides we have 15, so we're gonna have to have, things gonna have to change. So as long as there is a good education and there is time in advance and we start the messaging, the town starts the messaging early, I wouldn't put the polling places to keep the same as a, as a 
higher up in the list as other items. Um, as long as it goes accompanied with good communications from the town. And there's going to have to be communications with the town because the, the persons are going to change and the districts are going to change. Mm -hmm. So the, everything is going to have to change. So there's going to have to be a lot of outreach and together with that outreach should come the polling places. Um, I might be wrong, but I would hope that the town would do a good job of saying things change. Um, Oh no, that's that is the that's where the town clerk's office will reach out. But I believe the state will be um, walking us through that because all this all the cities and towns are going to be doing the same thing. So I'm not sure if it's going to be through our v voter registration system, something that automatically gets printed out because all these voter registration cards that are in the system have to be changed. Because when you look somebody up in our system right now, it says, okay, you know, Harkness Avenue precinct, whatever. Um, if that now falls in a new precinct, that all has to get changed at the state level. So when that happens, I think there's going to be an automatic a printout, like an acknowledgement notice. I believe that's how it works. I, you know, I haven't been involved in it, but that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So in order to summarize, at least, I think we've heard different views. Um, People have different approaches, and we're gonna. Keep, I think it's a conversation that we need to keep having, and maybe based on data um, and think things how things compare and how people go feeling that we go changing. It. But I think this is something that we should have a check in every time about the priorities and how to combine all the information. I would not want to say a hard stop now and set up all the parameters. Um, until we see the data. Uh, because there are different levels of information and I think we have to try to combine all together. Um, I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. Um, okay. So I wanted to ask, so um, I think we, went through some of the items I think we need to plan for next week. And other items it would be to set up the meetings for future meetings. Uh, but if, before we stop the discussion, is what information do we want to see and put Mike on working or any other homeworks that we want to give ourselves to move forward? We had talked about the clusters creating a list of that this relates about points of interest to the point of one of the items that we have to satisfy are points of interest. And I don't know how you want to go forward creating this list because we had, presumably we have some information that comes from previous meetings, but I think things have changed in the last 10 years. Do, uh, Susan, do you know if that's some information that is on the 2011 binder? No, that's why I went through that today. Try to find that. I couldn't find a thing. You know, I, I looked through all their meeting minutes and it didn't say anything. Um, okay. Yeah. And back then it was in person, so nothing's recorded. So there's no way of knowing what they were talking about. Okay. Yeah. So, so the question is, do we want to create a list that based on what we know of each person that represents uh, those are points of interest for each person? currently, or um, do we wait until we have some new boundaries or more or less approximate boundaries and we figure out if there are common points of interest at that time? You're, you're referring to communities of interest? Yes. Uh, Irina, from the, okay, all right, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, communities of interest and, uh, yeah, communities of interest and thinking of polling places, maybe thinking sure. forward, but communities of interest, polling places, or we go, in, go doing it as Tracy was suggesting, looking at the map as we are creating and trying to identify, make sure that we are not splitting communities of interest or make sure right. on the spot. I mean, I, I still, I mean, I do think that, I mean, I think the precincts will be the existing precincts, right, are kind of grouped, including like they're not, 
they're grouped around like densities, right? Certain clusters of populations and to a certain extent like communities of interest. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we take some, I, I mean, just, I'm assuming that, right? So we'd have to be working on redrawing the boundaries like interactively at a meeting. I don't see how else we would do mm -hmm. it. Like in terms of like, if we were meeting in person, right, we'd all be gathered around a map and like trying to lay it out, but now we're on computer. And so Mike and Sue, and we can like interactively try to look at boundaries. I don't see any other way to do that so much. And I, I'm not sure it's necessary to like come up with a list of clusters and community of interest, because I think as we have discussions on the different parts of the community, like we, or, you know, as we're, as we're going sort of through the town, like those will become apparent. Okay. Um, it is helpful if we do have, you know, as Joseph, I think, or somebody else was also talking about just like with South Amherst, but um, like some of the people on this committee have lived in Amherst quite a long time and so might feel like they know quite a bit about the clusters and communities of interest. Not that any of us are aware of like everyone, but so we might be able to do a rough cut you know, just interactively and not focus so much on like creating a list and like working from the list. Because I think as we have the discussion moving through each part of town, like those things will come to the surface. Mm -hmm. That's my take. But. Anybody has any other suggestion? Um, I, I mean, one thought I had is I really think that it's premature to try to make a list when we haven't yeah. seen the data yet. We don't know if we're making more precincts or fewer precincts or whatever. So okay. I think we'll know a lot more next week. Uh, hopefully we'll next, hopefully. next week. Yeah, if the <laughs> so, data actually gets dropped and Mike yeah. has a min minute to make the map, we'll know a lot more. Okay, no, I was just trying to plan for next week and what to prioritize because I think to Mike, we have, a, we would like a whole list of maps Right. Yes. Uh, Although we can't give them a whole day. list. <laughs> yeah. But then the question is, uh, based on timeline and the limited amount of time, to prioritize, I think. Um, this is this is all doable. I would say okay. if it's not. I, I would I would say something if it's not doable. Um, assuming that the data comes out in a timely manner, it's. Okay. I've seen it in the past where it's dropping today. And it doesn't drop for a week. So okay. um, next week's meeting may be very short. Okay. <laughs> and if the uh, data looks okay too. Not only is it there, but you can actually use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, and you know what I was gonna say is that the last group I counted their meetings, they met only seven times before they had a propose. Only mm -hmm. seven times. Ooh. What did you see their maps? Twenty eleven. Sue? Sue, did you see their maps? What they did? They printed out, I believe it was eleven by seventeen paper. Yeah. And, and they colored with crayons and they colored, I think, in what they wanted the precincts to be. <laughs> That's how they, they built were outlined their... in red. And yeah. yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, if we okay. meet every single week, we have a lot more meetings. So that's but, good. But they didn't need to do districts. Correct. No, that's true. That's true. Which would that's be correct. at least a couple meetings. Yeah. And also, I guess I'd be interested to in what type of public process they had. Like, I don't, I did live in Amherst in 2011. I don't remember there being like a public forum or anything? There was none, just... there were none. Um, they met in the first floor meeting room from five to seven, once a, once a week, well, not once a week. They met on 331, 47, 414, 428, 55, 526, and 62. And did and... the select board approve their boundaries before they were sent to the state? Yes, yeah, I think they were revised though, as revised. So I, I have a question, do we want to have a, um press release that this is happening so that people are aware that this is happening. Hmm. I think that's a good idea. It is a good idea. Uh, good idea. Yeah. I suggest we do it once we have some data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right now there's, so, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a land. Yeah, but, no it's considered, land. but I would not want to have wait too long. I would say some data, but since we, we have a short timeline, and we want to let people know and well, maybe participate. But, I would like to be out before mid-September. Sure. Definitely. Before, probably, if we can do something by the end of the month, it would be great, but not later than the first week of September to have a press release well, out. This is and, 
and even I guess once Mike verifies that he has the map, then, like he has yeah. data that we can look at, I guess. And I have a related question is that many, I don't know if all, but many of the town's committees, they have a council liaison who um, attends the meetings mainly as an observer, and then they can like report back to the council what's happening. And that's one way that both the council and the public can find out about what different committees are up to. Um, and I don't know, would we be assigned somebody like that? Is that a question for the council president? Do I don't think so. So in terms of we wouldn't have a council liaison on this committee? No, because our charge doesn't have that. They thought about having that and they, they nixed the idea. But I don't, I mean, I don't think that most, I mean, I'm on the transportation advisory committee and we don't have, it's not in our charge to have a liaison. It's just like, um, Oh, you like know, a courtesy kind of thing? Courtesy or like kind of thing, exactly. Communications kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. I mean, that maybe we could request one or something because if I know that the committee, uh, uh, I know the counselors have a lot of. My question, Tracy, what would be the purpose of having that? Because they, do you want in, we can report back or we can send a message, this is happening. They can look at the meetings, mm. but the council, Yes, they're going to have to vote on this, but the question is, can they come and say, we don't like the way the new districts, you have to start from scratch. Is there a basis where the council can reject if we satisfy, this is a question for everybody, if we satisfy the no more than 4,000, the 5%, the things, can the council say, we don't like the way you do the precincts and the districts because they have a vested interest if they want to continue being representative of one district or another. Can the council come and say, we don't like it? You have to start from scratch. Well, I think the council can weigh in and not approve it. I mean, it's in the council's purview to do that. Um, I mean, if, if we weren't gonna have, and I mean, maybe it's not necessarily have a council liaison, like come to every meeting, but like, there is a part of each council meeting towards the end where they have like updates from committees. And that's typically where a liaison will weigh in and just say, oh yeah, you know, I'm on the finance committee and this is what happened or something. If there weren't any finance committee items on the agenda earlier, and particularly even just to let the council know that like that the DAB is meeting and so on and hopefully like you know by the time they have the next council meeting on the 23rd like we have data and we're doing these things or something like just to provide a brief report to the council or a brief update on that v has happened. so could someone just voluntarily and they could switch out from from this meeting, offer to attend the next council meeting and provide an update and maybe make a, a request to the public as well. It would be an opportunity to talk to the mm -hmm. public uh, to do two things. One, invite someone to um, apply to be a part of the committee if it's not too late. And then secondly, um, notify the public that they can email Sue Audet um, comments, uh, anything that they're concerned about regarding uh, the redistricting, um, provide her email uh, and let folks know also the packages include maps that they might find helpful to, to read. I think that's a great idea. I just know from being with Amherst Media for so many years, after uh, Paul Bockelman became uh, uh, the town manager, it seemed um, it wasn't very popular to have these uh, liaisons uh, for the town council. Uh, and it sounds like they were also kind of restricted in their participation. So I'm just saying if we wait for that approval to get uh, someone like that, um, we might miss an opportunity to inform the public of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'd like to check with the town manager and, and see his take on that, because I know there is a point, like you say, Tracy, in each council meeting where there's board and committee updates. 
Um, I think there may be a little difference with this group because we're only for a spe specific purpose in a short timeline. So we don't fall into the same parameters that other ongoing boards and committees do. I wonder, I just want to get clarification on that. I mean, I, I think the one option, I mean, one thing is that those reports are at like the very end of the meeting, which knowing the council could be at like 11, 1130 yeah. midnight or later. And I've very yeah. rarely heard any reports on any of the committees. I mean, I think the town manager could put something in his memo. He does. But like perhaps one of us, and I would be happy to do that if nobody else is interested, like could even speak during public comment and just say that we're like up and running or something. And that from the public comment period of the meeting is actually like when the public is all still there and not, <laughs> you know, not at the fourth or fifth or sixth hour of the council where so particularly and so it just seems higher profile like if we one we're inviting public comment and participation and two if we're still able to continue try to recruit members or something that it would be nice to have it at the beginning of the meeting i mean even the town manager's report is at the end of the meeting so can we have a volunteer i'll do it unless anybody else feels strongly go for it <laughs> okay <laughs> all right then so that would Thank be uh, that would be August twenty third. But I will say, I mean, that's getting pretty late if we're trying to find members because, like as I said, right, it has to go to GOL and then it has to go to the council and so on. So I hope, like my kind of dream, if we ever found if anybody volunteers, is that they could actually be voted on by the council okay. to join on the twenty third. Okay. I, but I think those are two different items. I think yeah, no, we, of course, of course. If we can yeah. outreach and still, even if we get somebody who comes on board around that time or one, one week later, it would be great because again, the issue about quorum is something that worries me. I've been in committees that we hadn't had to cancel because we didn't have quorum. Um, so that would be- well and I think too, if we did have somebody from the public who is really interested, who wasn't officially appointed, like maybe there, you know, would be, there could be some way for them to like somehow be, let their opinions be known or something, at least, even if they're not officially a member of the committee yet. Yeah. So I have a question on the press release who, um, I can do a press release. Um, who, you know, I usually communicate with the newspaper. So if you'd like me to do that, or Mike, would you rather do it? Doesn't matter to me. I've never done it. Oh, okay. I've I, done it many times. Yep. Things go through Brianna for for us with stuff like this. I've never. D, okay. Yes. D, you want to have a say a comment? So um, again, I'm just representative uh, body, but uh, you know, I'm a communications person. I I don't mind writing a press release, but. Whoever writes the press release, I feel that um, it should be approved by at least the executive uh, committee um, that will be able to see it goes out. That's my advice. I would be, that's what I was going to suggest before sending a press release, if we could, could read it and approve it in the next meeting, so before sending it out. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to just send. So, uh, yeah, if you could put that on the uh, list of items, maybe we can we can create one in the next meeting uh, with everybody's input. No. 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 <laughs> no. It's oh, not, it's hard. You need to like somebody should draft something that we can respond to. <laughs> yes. So if D if D is volunteering to yeah. draft it or anybody, but sure. So if you all could um, let me know what bulleted type of points you want emphasized. One I know is um, we need someone for District 5. Um, and I forgot the other districts, so, you know, maybe four. Four, District 4. Oh, there's space for somebody from 4. So we can have up to two new people, including District 4 and District 5. Okay, so any of that bulleted, uh, or you can send me, Sue, once you have the, the minutes, I'll just take it from the minutes and draft something and um, have it available for, because I guess as a committee, we would have, well, have to approve it during the meeting to not violate open meeting law. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, so I could have a draft available and then we could read through it and tweak it. Yeah, just so you know, D, Joseph is our minute taker. So um... oh, I'm so sorry, Joseph. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and that's okay. But Joseph, um, when you're done, he's been he's been forwarding everything to me, and I've been putting it on the website. So check the website. I'll email you when it goes on there, so you know. Okay. Great. So I'll be happy to to do a draft, take a stab at it. Um, great. Thank you. So, um, the next item is we need to schedule our next meetings. Um, and I think there was a preference. Um, Susan, you said something, uh, I think with the, you have the information about the timelines of, of everybody. We had agreed that Tuesdays and Wednesdays between starting between four and seven, I think that was the agreement. Yeah. Uh, and I think Marilyn said that after a certain date, she's going to be freed up. Um, unfortunately, she didn't think we were going to start quite so late. I, I forget what the what she said. But um, so I think, you know, we can't really go by her schedule. She's just going to count on us setting the schedule and she'll be here when she can after she's freed up. So Wednesdays, I think Wednesdays were the better day for everybody. Well, I had a question. Who this? Um, we have the one appointed member who hasn't come to any right. of our meetings yet. What is, their, what is their schedule like? She was she the I, one that's going to be traveling? No, that was Marilyn. Her that was my heck. Hold on one second. Marilyn said that almost all September won't be around, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me just look here. Checking through the emails, just one second. Marilyn. I'm surprised, but because when we were appointed, we had to say that we were going to be available during this month. I know she's going. Marilyn's going on a trip from mid-September. She will be available after she returns from her trip from mid-September to mid-October. So that's her availability time. And I think that the nights were good with her. But my heck. Um, she said Wednesdays after five works beautifully for her. So Wednesdays, I think, was the day for everybody. I mean, you were having us said you were preferring after five, right? Mm -hmm. was, and Tammy, yeah, you too, because you work. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, um, I mean, one thing is if we want to, I guess, right, we're already the 11th. So we would be trying to meet say every Wednesday for now? Are there are there Wednesdays we would take off? I mean, I know that there's like the Jewish holidays. So like there's a week of Yom Kippur, there's a week of Rosh Hashanah and the week of Yom Kippur that we, but um, are there other, would we? Um, Look at the calendar, Rosh Hashanah starts on the 7th of September. Does anybody, is that gonna interfere with anybody? Um. No, I could be, the meeting would be on the 8th. If we do the meeting on the 8th. So that's Wednesdays. Uh -huh. But the, if Rosh Hashanah starts on the 7th, it should be okay with me. And then Yom Kippur, we would take off at Yom Kippur, right? On the 15th. Um, oh, that's on the 16th on my calendar. Well, it's, it's the, the, it's, it starts, it starts at, sundown? at sundown on the 15th. Uh, so does that, wait, does that mean Rosh Hashanah starts at sundown on the 8th? No, it starts on the seventh. Seventh, okay. Of the sixth, uh, of the sixth, it's six to seventh. Okay. Let me see. <laughs> That's what my calendar says. Well, um, how about we we schedule so for August eighteenth, the twenty fifth, the first and the eighth. We try to do Wednesdays, and then right. by then we can we take it up. Sure. Sounds good. If, if it turns out that people's schedules change because of the beginning of the school year or whatever, we can revisit at the end of August. Right. Uh, yeah. That sounds for me, good. For me, it's okay, but I don't know the rest of the people. That, um... So, I mean, I know UMass classes and like Amherst schools, they start the week of the, whatever that is, the 30th, right? So yes. the first is the first day of UMass classes. And, but 
I, I like that idea of just scheduling out maybe like the first like three meetings or yeah I'm actually and then I'm gonna say something actually on the eighth I have a conflict I'm gonna have to ask if we can set at five thirty. Let's schedule the next three weeks and then take it from there. Okay. That's good. So the 18th, okay. the 25th, September 1st, from 5 to 7? 5 yes. to 7. Good. Yes. And also, I guess, if we have new members, right, when are they available? So. Yep. Okay. Okay. So is there any other item that we want to discuss? that we did not cover in today's meeting? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I don't think we have anybody for uh, public comment. No. Nope. Okay. okay. So um, does anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. second. <laughs> All okay. second. Oh, it's okay. Um, so everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Can Aye. we do that? Oh, oh okay. Roll call. I, I can go do a roll call. Uh, we all agree. Yeah. Peggy? I agree. Aye. Tracy? Aye. Sammy first? Aye. Joseph Gordon? Aye. Irene? Aye. Irene from the Aye. Okay. All right. All right. Thank See you. you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Thank you.